So Dr. Hoffman, thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this interview for the National Social Anxiety Center. You really have contributed so much to um, the research and interventions for individuals with social anxiety. And so this is such a wonderful opportunity for us to learn more from you, hoping that you can share a little bit more about your research today. I'd be delighted. Thank you. Okay, so my first quest question is, what have you learned about the mechanisms for social anxiety disorder um, in your research? Yeah, so um, I think it's fair to say that uh, social anxiety is a very um, a heterogeneous group of uh, so individuals with this uh, problem, with severe social anxiety. They consist of a um, of uh, many different subgroups. And it's important to, um, uh, to acknowledge that and to also then to specifically tailor uh, those aspects that are uh, salient to these individuals. So I don't think there's a one size fits all approach is working. Um, rather, there are a number of cognitive uh, mechanisms that we know uh, work quite well, but also uh, a number of more emotional behavioral mechanism and, uh, mechanisms. And it's, it's, it's also kind of very arbitrary to distinguish that in cognitive behavior and emotions because it's all linked, obviously. But um, uh, there are, uh, I think it's fair to say that, that um, changes in the way people perceive uh, threat, uh, social threat is quite often quite essential. Um, so in a way, they, people with severe social anxiety, uh, anxiety often uh, believe that they are um, in danger somehow because uh, whatever they do is outside of the normal, uh, outside of the norm and, and somehow it would have negative repercussion if they violate these norms and they exaggerate them. Obviously we all have this experience, we all have this feeling that uh, we want to stay within uh, the boundaries of what is uh, what is possible in a social context and also what what is desirable and expected from us. So people with social anxiety disorder often um, kind of over predict uh, the likelihood that a, uh, that an event is not going to turn out well and, e and more importantly if it turns out badly these consequences consequences would be disastrous. There are other in, uh, groups of individuals who are more, um, uh, who do have actually a social skills deficit. It's a small portion of them, but, but certainly we do encounter those. Uh, there are also other people who have um, uh, sort of a more, you know, personality characteristic that, that keeps them that, that, uh, very isolated and, and, uh, and, uh, and as a result, they suffer obviously from this loneliness, from this isolation. And uh, often you need to uh, intervene in multiple ways. You need to kind of create mm -hmm. a context in which they can be the best social partner they can be in, in, their, uh, as a, in their nature and want to be. So it's often not enough to simply target one very specific little thing that, that, that you observe as a clinician, but rather you often need to change the real context of the individual mm -hmm. in a broader way and get them uh, in a way comfortable with, with a different lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm guessing that this is done in really that deep contextualized understanding is done through with collaboration uh, with the patient. Very much so. So we believe that um, uh, group uh, interventions can be quite helpful um, simply because they provide a, a context, a social context where you can try out a lot of the things that uh, um, in, in terms of exposure practices. We, uh, we often combine that and I think this is most effective to combine group intervention with individualized tailored mm -hmm. intervention. So we often start out as a group and then move into a much more individualized exposure a cognitive behavioral approach um, uh, as clients become more comfortable with uh, more general issues, but then you tailor that and target that to the individual uh, in individualized treatments. Okay, thank you. Um, and what interventions can clinicians use to improve treatment outcomes? You talked a lot about um, group versus individual interventions. I know your research also fo focuses on 
mindfulness, um, self-compassion, social mishaps? What are the things that you would really hope that clinicians would want to include in their treatment um, of individuals with social anxiety? Yeah, and there are really different, um, uh, you mentioned a number of uh, very effective uh, interventions that work for some people more than for others. The, um, in my experience, and also uh, supported by a considerable amount of research as well, uh, is one particular uh, that, uh, uh, target that seems to produce the greatest effect, which is uh, what, what I would call social mishap exposures. Uh, um, it's obviously very difficult to get people to that point, but the, in essence, social mishap exposure um, creates the, uh, the situation for individuals that are actually exactly the, the, the things that, are, that they're so, trying so hard to avoid. Uh, through all sorts of different ways, through active avoidance, safety behaviors, and 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 or med using medication or any other things, they are trying to really avoid these kind of worst case scenarios. Uh -huh. Because if these things happen, it would be a disastrous, long lasting, irreversible con at, uh, uh, as all these irreversible consequences. So what we're doing is we're creating actually these these various scenarios. We actually expose people to their worst case. Uh, we expose them to embarrassing, highly undesirable social situations. We stay away from role plays. Role play exposures has been, uh, have been done in the past in, uh, for many decades with limited success. Uh, they are often used sort of to sharpen your social skills and also to, to act like a, 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 as if uh, in the as if approach. But what you really implicitly telling people is that the real world out there is much too dangerous to try mm -hmm. that out yourself. And that's why we need to put your, put gloves on and be really kind to each other and do this all in role play. And it's not, this is not real life, don't worry. And all of that sends a, the really wrong message because the mm -hmm. world out there, the social world is really not that terribly dangerous. People do stupid things all the time. We do this on a daily basis. There are political leaders, leaders who make their living by doing stupid things. And unfortunately they are succeeding. So I'm not gonna name any names, uh, but, but, but we know them. <laughs> so, so the point being is social, uh, so, social skills and, and, and uh, yeah, social competence is very weakly correlated with social anxiety. People, mm -hmm. Some people have social skills deficit and for that reason, they might experience discomfort. But there are plenty of people who, are, who have horrible social skills and are, uh, and are not socially anxious whatsoever. And the reverse is true. Uh, some people with excellent social skills have really strong social anxiety. So the point is that we want to teach people that the real world out there is actually not that terribly dangerous. Nothing horrible will happen. You will be momentarily uh, uh, feel extreme discomfort and that's desirable, but you will see that, that you will survive, that life goes on um, and, and people often chuck it off and, and, uh, and you know, people do s silly things all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a reporter for uh, The Guardian once asked, uh, wrote a book on that. She actually made a, uh, she wrote a book on, on this very issue. She wrote an entire book on social anxiety and, and focused heavily on, on um, social mishap exposure. And I've forgotten now the name of the book. I think it was called, Sorry, I, I'm Late, I Don't Want to Be Here or something like that. It was, <laughs> it was actually sold very well. Yeah. And so I, I talked to her on the phone a few times and one, one time she asked me, so tell me what, what should I do? I have social anxiety. What should, what, how should I, what, what can I do in terms of um, uh, exposing myself? Would you feel comfortable in giving me some hints? And I told her, well, um, where do you live? She said, well, I live in London. And, and what are you concerned about? Well, I'm concerned about appearing stupid. And, and you know, as, as many people do with social anxiety. I, um, so that when we, after a few uh, uh, thinking about what, what kind of situations would be appropriate, uh, we decided on, uh, on the following. She would go to the, uh, into the subway of, uh, in London, uh, the, the tube, they call it, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, would ask uh, five um, random people uh, uh, the following two questions in order to appear stupid. Number one, um, does, and without, the, the important thing is also not to have any excuses around it, not to make it softer, but really appearing totally dumb by asking, excuse me, uh, do, do you know if 
England has a queen? And if so, what is her name? All right. Uh, and uh, she did this with actually uh, the, fr uh, and the funny part is that if you ask people uh, spontaneously this question in London, uh, you will be surprised about the answer that you're getting because the first two individuals were, uh, responded with, uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, of course we do. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Victoria. Uh, and the first two individuals said that. <laughs> so it was a pretty funny uh, moment. But anyway, so she did, she continued doing that and, and practices like that. So this is an example of where you evaluate what actually would happen if the worst thing happens. Um, mm -hmm. And nothing bad is happening. The people would just uh, look at you in a weird way. Actually, they embarrass themselves by giving the wrong answer to something very obviously incorrect. Um, uh, and, uh, and life goes on. And so she did a number of those other uh, uh, similar exercises and apparently got a hold of her anxiety quite well and wrote in this book as a result. So it sounds like one of the things that is just so helpful across um, individuals with social anxiety is really allowing them to come up with these situations where they can either disconfirm beliefs that aren't really helpful or create new learning to be able to live in this social world that we have and 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 really learning that you know it's it's not that dangerous and if something does happen that isn't maybe social socially desirable most people recover anyway that's right that's right yeah yeah and the important thing is that it it really needs to hit hit the core of their mm -hmm. problem so it's not enough to just uh, create embarrassing situations, but rather they need to be situations that sort of target their, their main concern that they have mm -hmm. about, uh, about how they see themselves. This, can, this doesn't have to be appearing stupid. This could be appearing rude or, or it could be um, appearing um, uh, 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 non-emotional, non-empathic. And um, again, this is not we are not training people to be that way. We don't mm -hmm. want them to be. In fact, if the whole world consisted of people with social anxiety, it would be a very, very wonderful world because people mm -hmm. care too much about each other in a way. Mm -hmm. or they, you know, that, and that's a desirable feature that we don't want them to abandon. In a way, we want them to be a bit more selfish than they usually are. So, you know, uh, for that reason, social anxiety is a bit of a... Um, uh, an, a highly adaptive evolutionary trait that went awry because we, mm -hmm. we, we want to be liked. This is in us, this is in our nature. But if, peop if, if you want to be liked too much and if you don't just want to um, uh, you know, conform to any norms, putting yourself, your own desires and wishes aside all the time, then, you become, then it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, we, we don't want to, people to become rude and obnoxious and aggressive, and, 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 uh, that, uh, but, but we want them to, to realize that, that even if they show these specific behaviors in those situations, sometimes it's not a big deal. And by doing so, you break this, this, these walls around them because mm -hmm. they put themselves in these, in these confined uh, spaces that mm -hmm. uh, social spaces that doesn't allow them a lot of liberty to move anymore because they are so confined by their perceived standards and norms and how odd want to be and so we we are we are uh, actively breaking down these walls mm -hmm. i like that term breaking down and you know it's as a clinician it's been such an honor to work with individuals who have the willingness to to take on these um, in vivo exposures and just create that new learning to broaden their world and their life and, and create more opportunities. Absolutely. So um, I'm really curious about um, what, I know you're interested in neuroscience and have there been specific things that you've learned um, looking at and studying neuroscience that can really help us with the understanding of, of treating social anxiety? Yeah, you know, social anxiety. It, it, yes, I, I do believe so. So we, we have we've done a number of uh, studies where we can also quite accurately predict whether somebody will respond to treatment or not, depending on their brain um, activation act, activity to certain stimuli, but also even connect how things are connected in the brain. What we learned is that um, um, that something is quite consistent with uh, the other with other clinical. Um, 
evidence that uh, that links social anxiety very closely to depression. Um, and this is uh, from a clinical perspective, we know that um, uh, similar to dep well, depression and social anxiety is a highly comorbid, this is the most comorbid diagnostic category that we have is depression. Uh, about the, you know, a third or so are also depressed. And we know that, that they, they are uh, directly linked. So, so treating social anxiety will also directly affect uh, depression and vice versa. Uh, and it's uh, clinically it's linked to sort of a negative view of oneself. Only in social anxiety, it's much more focused on the self as a social object, whereas mm -hmm. in depression, it's much more generalized. It's the, mm -hmm. it's, but it's still this very similar nature of negative view of oneself. Now, we, we from the neuro, uh, neuroscience literature, uh, um, um, neuroscience finding, findings, it's quite consistent that we also observe that there is a, uh, if you will, a, um, a lesser activity activity in this in uh, in reward in the reward system so they're very much affected by that similar to depressed individuals so it's not so much a a fear and anxiety but it's also very much of a a um, negative a, a low positive affect uh, mm -hmm. uh, disorder not just a high negative affect but also low positive affect disorder mm -hmm. that is reflected in some of these neurobiological correlates what does it mean for concretely clinical intervention. I believe it's, um, uh, you know, interventions that specifically lift and enhance positive affect, not just targeting and reducing negative affect, but also left, uh, enhancing positive affect seems to be quite effective. Um, now, this is, um, this gets us into meditation uh, practices. There's some um, I know also, uh, you know, my colleague, uh, uh, Michelle Grask has done similar work uh, that we've also been doing. Uh, on a, uh, we also call it positive affect training for that reason, because it incorporates a lot of those, uh, you know, meditative loving kindness and compassion meditation strategies into treatment that seems to be quite effective for, especially for the ones that show that also are, are highly depressed, especially those. Um, so we, again, we have also, fairly significant number of individuals with social anxiety who are not uh, depressed. Um, we find it particularly helpful for the depressed, for the, for, for, for depressed individuals to uh, incorporate uh, uh, loving kindness and compassion meditation. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, my last question is really related to um, culturally specific ways to enhance treatment. Um, I know you've been really involved with the International Association of, of Cognitive and Behavioral Therapies, and really this is a research interest of yours. Um, what would be helpful to share with clinicians about culturally specific ways to enhance treatment for social anxiety? Social anxiety is, is very much uh, a culturally um, specific phenomenon, really. It's, it's you, you don't, you cannot be socially anxious on an island all by yourself. Um, without anybody around. Uh, it's impossible to do that. Um, you need to have another person to be socially anxious. Um, uh, nevertheless, there's a great degree of self, uh, of, of the sort of this, the social self that is sort of at the core, if you will, but it's more of a way how you perceive yourself from other people's point of view. It's sort of an exaggerated theory of mind phenomenon. You know, you kind of have a, take a perspective from others too much so. Um, culture is, 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 is crucially important because it determines how people interact with one another. It is sort of the overwritten, uh, you know, uh, overriding, overarching sort of, these are the norms how one interact, with, uh, how people interact with one another. They are culturally mm -hmm. Uh, fairly specific phenomena. We have uh, a, one, one probably the, the one that is very uh, 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 strongly debated often is, the, is this uh, Asian Korean uh, phenomenon of Taishin Kyo Fusho, uh, which is the, um, uh, the, 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 the concern that you're not embarrassing yourself, but rather you do something that embarrasses the other person, often expressed as, you know, such as body odor, you sit in an enclosed compartment or in a subway, uh, you believe that you have a strong body odor that would then uh, embarrass the other person because they wouldn't know what to do with because they couldn't sit anywhere else and so they're embarrassed um, 
So you're concerned about embarrassing another person. It's kind of difficult for Westerners to completely capture and understand it because it's very much tied to a highly collectivistic society, which is mm -hmm. the Asian, um, Korean, uh, uh, Japanese, Korean uh, society. Um, interestingly, as, as you, when you observe you know, people coming to, to the US, you, when you study that here, it disappears. It's not a, a biologically, genetically um, tie, a linked uh, problem, but rather it is expressed in this particular society. Um, so other, gen, uh, so, you know, the first generation still has it, the second generation less so, and the third generation not at all. So that's a typical uh, picture that you see when, when you look at it uh, in, in the US. So you typically don't find it. Um, there are many other uh, call, uh, 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 social, social oddities or, or, or specific culturally, um, uh, cultural um, aspects that are that are, that are, or, or social anxiety linked to culture. I wrote an entire book on that. Uh, if I could plug, give a plug on, on the social uh, foundations of emotions, where we specifically look at the various aspects how cultures shape and and modify um, uh, these these issues. Um, um, and we have even you know uh, uh, emotion, social emotions that are uniquely tied to certain cultures. There's the example of, of schadenfreude in, in German, which is the pleasure that you derive by seeing other people uh, experiencing some misfortunes, which in Germans seem to find it funny and they laugh about it. Um, so as an example. Um, and and, and um, so we have, um, um, so culture is, 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 is highly um, tied very strongly tied to the experience of social anxiety. We even also observe that not only with, even within a culture, as people progress through the various stages in life, there are very different um, sort of social pressures on the individual that will make them more or less likely to experience social anxiety. Um, in a highly individual, uh, individualistic society, such as the US, um, this is very much, um, uh, relevant because people are sort of they're, they're growing up initially in a very tight family environment and then they're expected to form them very strong ties uh, as they grow older uh, the the rules uh, social rules in the u.s are quite complicated even though they seem uh, easy but they're not and many mm -hmm. foreigners experience that as a as sort of a culture shock because there are unwritten rules that that are where closeness is 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 initially very easy, the superficial level of interacting is quite quite quick, and mm -hmm. you're friendly on a very superficial level. But then, when uh, when you kind of need to rely on people and and re, uh, uh, regulate emotions through others with others, then uh, it is becomes quite difficult. So it, it's in a way it's difficult to find good deep friendships, um, uh, but it's very easy to make very, you know, uh, a lot of superficial friends. So this, this will affect obviously social anxiety. For that reason, it's, uh, there is a strong cultural discrepancy and, and difference in, in the various cultures. You find in uh, individualistic societies, uh, a lot more anxiety problems, in, including social anxiety and uh, in, um, Collectivistic societies much less so because this is buffered through through the social network, if you will. Mm -hmm. So the more connected you are with others, the more you can regulate your own emotions in an adaptive way. Hmm. Yeah, that all makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like um, you know really getting to know the patient, um, their background, um, and their not I only mean. individual context but cultural context are all really crucial parts of of providing an effective treatment for social anxiety. Exactly right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate not only the time that you've provided for this um, interview, but everything that you've contributed to our field. My pleasure, Michelle. Thank you.